Well, hello everyone. My name is Seth Thompson. I'm the District Wildlife Biologist with Virginia Department of Wildlife Resources. I'm based here in Wise, Virginia. I have a six county district that I cover. I think uh, probably a lot of you in the district know me. I'm, I'm sort of known as the bear man, it seems like, and I do work with, with black bears a lot. Um, but fortunately tonight, we're gonna to be talking about some other wildlife issues, um, particularly golden wing warblers. But I wanted to start off by just sharing with you some uh, really cool updates on some stuff that we have going on uh, with the Virginia Department of Wildlife Resources and things that I'm involved in um, that are uh, really exciting, at least for me. Uh, you'll see on the first uh, slide here, we've got an elk down there. That is actually a Wise County bull. Uh, we've got some collars out on some cow elk in Wise County to get a sense of how many elk we have and where, what their distribution is and their travels and habitat selection. So we've got a lot of exciting things with elk uh, and we'll talk about some more of those. Uh, the bird on the top left is a loggerhead shrike. Uh, we have a lot of those uh, birds in Russell County specifically, but also Scott and Lee County. Um, but they are a, a predatory uh, uh, bird, basically. Um, they go after mice. They're a small bird. They're about the size of a mockingbird. Um, but, and they're, they used to be called a butcher bird. That's kind of the common name for them. Really fascinating species. I get to help out with capturing and banding those birds and sort of monitoring their populations throughout my district, but particularly in Russell County. Really neat uh, species. Uh, they're, they're found around particularly small grass, uh, short grass prairies, um, so any place where you have cattle, uh, you'll see this bird is, is on a barbed wire fence. They actually impale their prey, uh, insects, um, lizards, snakes, uh, you name it, other birds. Uh, they are a predatory species. Also on hawthorn thorns, just a really interesting species I'm, I'm grateful to get to work with. And also you'll notice the peregrine falcons. I get to help monitor peregrine falcons. In my district, we have a pair that's been nesting consistently up at Brake Center State Park on the, the cliffs. And we were able to locate that nest again this year and they uh, successfully hatched three eggs and those, those three chicks ended up fledging and, and doing well. That's two years in a row they've, they've fledged uh, three chicks. So that's been really exciting as well. Some other things that aren't so exciting and wonderful, um, we do have mange in bears. Some of you may have heard about this. Uh, in the northern part of the state of Virginia. And if you look on this uh, map to the left, uh, early on, uh, we had a, a detection in Rockingham County, I think in 1994, 95 maybe. But then in 2014, we started getting consistent reports uh, and carcasses, uh, unfortunately, of a number of bears in Frederick County and Shenandoah County. And since then, it's just exploded. It's really um, moved across the landscape affected a whole lot of bears. We just had a really scary thing with that. Uh, we've got a lot of dead bears. It's, it's a really horrible situation to try to manage for. Um, there's no real cure for it. We've tried treating bears, capturing and treating bears with antiparasitics. Um, and we released those bears back into the wild with collars. And then within a year, they have mange just as bad, if not worse, uh, and end up dying. Uh, so there's no known treatment at this time. We're trying to do um, some research here in Virginia. We're coordinating with other states such as West Virginia, Maryland, and uh, certainly Pennsylvania. They have a lot of mange in Pennsylvania to try to get a better sense uh, on a regional perspective of what we can do for bears. Um, but right now it's, it's, uh, it's not knock on wood. It's not here in Southwest Virginia but we do have it in the state and, and given its expansion over the years you can see the, the red squares and dots are sort of moving south and west. Um, it is headed this direction. I do get a number of pictures of bears from people in my in the area here around Wise and, and Lee County especially of bears that appear to have a skin condition and folks are worried about mange but so far anyway those bears appear to have more of a, a fungal infection which is somewhat common in this area but we've never confirmed mange just yet, and hopefully, knock on wood, we don't. Uh, the other disease issue that we're really watching closely is chronic wasting disease. Um, some of you are familiar with mad cow disease or kutzfeld jacob disease in people. Uh, chronic wasting disease is the deer family version of that. 
Uh, we do have uh, chronic wasting disease in the northern part of Virginia. A lot of, frankly, a lot, um, coincidentally, some of the same counties that we have uh, Maine and Bear, so Frederick, Shenandoah, Clark, Warren, uh, those northern counties. But we last November we detected CWD and a free-ranging adult buck, uh, white-tailed deer in southern, the very southwestern corner of Montgomery County. So that was a big uh, eye, eyebrow raiser in a big way because the closest detection to that is in Madison County, so way way up towards uh, the northern part of the state again. So that was a significant jump to Montgomery County. So that has us really scratching our heads. Uh, we do sample for CWD every year. And some of those counties between Madison and Montgomery, we have some good samples for, and some of those counties we don't. Um, so we're gonna be doing, this really changes the game. We've got CWD in our region now. Um, and you know this this positive in Montgomery County is actually closer to, for example, our elk area in Buchanan County than it is to Madison County than the closest known positive. Um, so that's really scary for us. We're puckered up a bit. We're going to be doing a lot more ramped up um, CWD surveillance this fall during the hunting season, and certainly in this three county disease management area of Montgomery, Pulaski, and Floyd. Uh, that has radically changed hunting regulations. It has radically changed our ability to rehab fawns, orphan fawns, or injured fawns. Um, for hunters, taking uh, carcasses out of outside of those counties is a no-no. You have to to clean all the meat off the the, the skeleton, the bones, and leave the um, uh, brain tissue and um, backbone and everything in the county. You can't take it out of those counties. So a lot of big changes because of that detection. So knock on wood, it doesn't continue. It's, it's a matter of time, unfortunately, um, but we'll try to keep it at bay as much as we can. But that's, that's an emerging uh, issue that we are facing. But back to some more positive news for DWR. Some of you know, uh, you know, for years we were the Virginia Game Commission. Uh, and then even more recently, we were the Virginia Department of Game and Inland Fisheries. And then in July of 2020, we became the Virginia Department of Wildlife Resources. And that has come about uh, over time, you know, hunting, hunting has declined uh, in popularity, although we do a lot to try to recruit and retain new hunters. Uh, but we, we realize that uh, with our demands for other, other issues, non-game species, um, habitat management, wildlife conflict response, other issues that really don't have anything to do with hunting per se. Uh, so we re recognize to stay relevant and be um, uh, more relevant, I guess, and going big tent and kind of getting rid of the game. Like we're still, obviously we're very interested in hunting and fishing and the revenue that we get that funds our agency from hunting and fishing license and boat registration dollars but we recognize a tremendous number of Virginians are, are non-consumptive uh, wildlife recreationists or interested in wildlife that, that doesn't really have anything to do with hunting and fishing. And so we, we changed our name. And uh, I think that's a positive move. Another thing that's really positive that we're excited about is our AML pilot grant. Um, that's something in the region you, you all may be aware of, uh, the abandoned mine land pilot program with, that Congress reinstates. Uh, basically, for our grant, we received $2.275 million, and that money will be used first and foremost to address abandoned mine land features that are problematic, so pre-1977 uh, reclamation laws. So, and this is gonna be in Buchanan County. We've got about 2,600 acres. Uh, we will be leasing that for public access, uh, for hunting, fishing, wildlife viewing, the, the whole shebang but also we'll be addressing those uh, abandoned mine land features that could be even potentially dangerous, that clog streams um, and so on. So we'll be doing that and we'll be able to enhance the habitat. We're gonna do some habitat improvement projects, trying to control some invasive uh, plants and shrubs and trying to improve uh, habitat quality. So we're quite excited about that. The other one is the VPA HIP grant of $2.9 million. VPA HIP stands for Voluntary Public Access Habitat Improvement Program. And that's through the U.S. Department of Agriculture. 
Um, what that grant does is kind of similar. It allows us to compensate private landowners for public access for wildlife recreational opportunities. Again, hunting, fishing, it also could be boating and boating access. We've got, you know, the Powell River uh, and the Pound River, for example, are, it's really difficult to find um, legal access because it's, it's mostly private lands. So we'll be able to use those grant monies to compensate landowners and also to build boat ramps, parking areas, stuff to facilitate safe and um, appropriate access for those uh, recreational opportunities. But also for hunting, for fishing, every anything else, viewing. We have we have um, landowners lined up to just that want to have folks come and, and do wildlife viewing on their property. So we're excited about that to be able to compensate uh, private landowners for that public access. The other big thing, of course, is elk. We've got lots of exciting things going with our elk program that we're we're super excited about. Keyword here is excited, right? Uh, but a lot of elk viewing. Um, once a week, starting next week for, I think, six weeks, we're going to be, DWR, that is, is going to be hosting some uh, public elk viewing, kind of a VIP behind the, the scenes. Uh, we had an elk viewing sweepstakes, which is available now, kind of another um, viewing opportunity, special viewing opportunity, but also has a stay at the Breaks Park in a cabin um, for four people, uh, food vouchers at the Rhododendron Lodge uh, restaurant, uh, binoculars. I think there's a whole bunch of other swag that goes into that uh, sweepstakes and that's open through the 17th. Um, but at any rate, we're, we're going to raise about, looks like about $40,000 from that sweepstakes giveaway. So we're quite excited. We're going to do a habitat project on at Breaks Interstate Park. There's about a five acre uh, meadow um, at the park that has a lot of autumn olive and um, fescue and other things that aren't really that great for wildlife. We're going to completely um, convert that to native shrubs, native grasses, native form species in there, completely convert that habitat. So we're quite excited. We're going to be able to um, improve the access and the trailhead and to facilitate people to go back and, and see wildlife there. So we're happy to partner with Brakes on that. Uh, we also are going to offer an elk hunting season next uh, next fall, I guess it would be in 2022, in the elk management zone of Wise Dickinson Buchanan. Very limited hunting opportunity, but it's going to generate a lot of excitement. Um, six bull tags uh, total, and we've got access through the VPA HIP program and the pilot program to facilitate that and get hunters to places where there are elk. Um, the other thing to mention is the elk cam. If you Google our website or go to dwr.virginia.gov, I think on the, even on the front page, you'll be able to click on the elk uh, webcam. You can go, especially this time of year, right now, early mornings and evenings, I'd say around 6.30 or 7 in the evenings, click on there and you're liable to see lots of elk. Um, so that's exciting. Lots of folks are connected to elk that way. We also have a big project that we're starting to work on for the Coalfield Expressway um, up in Buchanan County. You, all the, the little dots on the left side of your screen on the map, those are locations of collared elk. And the white line that kind of crawls up through there, that is the expressway, Coalfield Expressway. Um, and you can see elk are right on or along that uh, highway. And currently that is not open to the public. Um, and, and it may be that once it is open to the public, those elk are going to move off, but we are concerned about vehicle collisions there. Uh, the picture to the right shows, that's my truck, uh, kind of in a canyon in a cut through the mountains there, and some elk are basically in this canyon, so they either have to go with or against the traffic to get in and out of those canyons. So it presents an issue and something we're working on um, to mitigate with the construction companies and with VDOT to get ahead of that. At the very least, we ought to be able to put some signs up to warn motorists, maybe to slow down and be watching for, for elk. But we have collared elk that are gonna really tell us where they wanna be and where they wanna cross the road. And so we'll be able to use that collar data to uh, target those mitigation measures, whether it's signs or features or fencing to keep elk off the road. So we're quite excited about that, quite a big project. Now then, uh, to get back into what tonight's talk is going to be about, uh, the golden wing warbler is a, is a bird that we are concerned about here in Virginia and across Appalachia for that matter. 
And I just wanted to talk a little bit about the species and kind of what we are doing as an agency and maybe what you can as a possible landowner um, or citizen, engaged citizen. Um, but I'll, I'll first of all say that I'm not a, an expert in golden wing warblers at, by any means, uh, but it's definitely a species that's on my radar screen that I, I do uh, do a little work with within the department on. And so I'm excited to share that story with you tonight. Uh, one thing to mention is that we have the Virginia Wildlife Viewing Plan. Some of you may have been involved in the development of this plan, but it, it encompasses all, all types of non uh, consumptive wildlife viewing and birds fall right into that. Birds are, as you all know, birds are very conspicuous and it's anybody can get into bird watching. A uh, very easy thing to do. Um, and we have, if you want to view uh, this wildlife viewing plan, I encourage you to go to our website, dwr.virginia.gov, and you can, you can search for, you use this link if you want, but you can search for the wildlife viewing plan if you want to view that. But to kind of get back to my uh, introduction about why we changed our name, you know, we, we do a whole lot more than just uh, hunting and fishing. We, we do a lot of non-game stuff, as I mentioned, uh, wildlife conflicts, wildlife viewing is becoming more and more of, of, a, of an interest and something that we are engaged in. We actually have two watchable wildlife biologists who kind of help and uh, probably work with many of you through the um, naturalist, uh, the uh, Virginia naturalist, um, so we, we do a lot of stuff, uh, not just cater to the hook and bullet crowd, I guess is what I'm getting at. Uh, we have uh, freshwater mussel species specialists that work on the clinch, the Powell, and um, the Holston, uh, south of North Fork. We have a bat specialist who does a lot of great work. Of course, a lot of those species, most of which are federally protected. Um, we have a herpetologist who is fantastic, some of you know and have seen. Um, the changes in being able to use um, newts and salamanders for bait and how that has changed, uh, thanks to him. Also the box turtles, about how many box tur Eastern box turtles that you can um, possess. Uh, so he's really active too. We've got a lot of great stuff going on in the, in the agency to be proud of. So getting back to birds, you know, we've seen precipitous declines in bird species across North America for several decades now. It's quite alarming. Uh, and many of you are aware of the, the outbreak of some sort of disease uh, or die off um, across the Mid-Atlantic and into the upper Midwest. There's still a lot, I mean, thousands upon thousands of birds have been submitted for testing at different, very high level um, uh, research facilities and disease diagnostic labs, but we still do not have a clear answer as to what's going on. Um, you may have seen recently that we did reinstate along with other states to say, okay, as long as you are cleaning your bird feeder uh, appropriately, you may resume feeding, at, at least at this point. But reports of these die-offs have has dropped enough that we feel safe to do so. Uh, but we've seen a lot of declines in bird species and it's it's been quite alarming. Uh, here in Virginia, we have over 400 species of birds uh, and we've seen declines due to habitat loss, fragmentation, environmental degradation, predation, parasitism, other causes of natural mortality, and of course climate change, the big uh, gorilla in the room. But if you see uh, on this chart below of uh, eastern meadowlarks, you know that's a, a grassland species. We're losing our grasslands big time. A lot of those are, are growing back up and being retimbered uh, through succession or on purpose or just being developed. So uh, meadowlarks, as you can see, are just declining uh, have been for, for decades. And we try to take a, a real comprehensive approach at DWR. We have regulatory review. We, we comment and engage the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service on regulations. We issue regulations through our department to try to protect uh, bird species. Uh, we weigh in when the Forest Service does any sorts of projects or planning. Uh, we, we always try to weigh in and coordinate on, on regulate. Uh, regulations and laws. Land acquisition, I think my agency has over 220,000 acres that we own, uh, which statewide is not a whole lot, but we still have, we can do a lot on those wildlife management areas in terms of conservation practices, habitat improvement, uh, and so on. 
Uh, we do a lot of habitat work, not only on our WMAs, our wildlife management areas, but also on private lands. I mentioned the, the AML project, we're going to be doing habitat improvement. The VPA HIP program, we can do habitat improvement with that program. Uh, there's some other ways that we can, can work with private landowners to achieve, and federal uh, cooperators with the Forest Service, for example, to improve habitat conditions for a lot of different bird species. Education and outreach, here, here we are tonight, and out, a really nice outreach opportunity. And thank you, by the way, uh, Hi Knob Naturalists, uh, for inviting me and allowing me to speak, and for you for tuning in tonight, or today, whatever it may be. Um, so we do a lot of work with education and outreach, conservation planning. We have management plans. Uh, as you just saw, we have the, the wildlife viewing plan. And that, of course, involves a lot of birds and other uh, conservation practices for wildlife viewing. And that's just one plan. We've, we've got a, a multiple different plans. Um, and again, we, we work with nonprofits, with other state and federal agencies to uh, try to manage birds and, bird, and their habitat appropriately. Research and monitoring, we do a lot of, of that in-house within DWR. We have a lot of partners, both nonprofits, again, uh, as well as several universities uh, in collaboration with those, those folks and, and on contract to do a lot of research and monitoring for us. Uh, the Virginia Breeding Bird Atlas is a huge undertaking, but that's basically a citizen science approach to collecting data on, on birds. Very, very valuable information, very helpful and informative into how we manage birds and where we focus our, our time and funding. But the golden wing warbler, uh, beautiful bird here in the Appalachians. It's, it's uh, slated to potentially be threatened to be uh, protected or listed under the Endangered Species Act. Um, would be nice if we could stave off the decline of this species to avoid that, uh, but it may happen. Uh, and here is the male. Uh, I'll try to play this video. That is the call of a male warbler, golden wing warbler. Here's the female there on the left. Uh, but this is the type of habitat they prefer. They like open area, shrubby, sh you know, shrub fields, interspersed, and a mosaic of different types of forests, but mostly these open, um, early successional type habitats, um, which we're losing. As I, as I mentioned, you know, farmers, you know, less and less agriculture on the landscape, and more of this type of habitat is growing up into uh, trees, basically. Um, and which is not good for golden wing warblers and a whole host of other species, by the way. Um, but we have, you know, a decline in this habitat type, and it's something that we really need to, to consider, especially for golden wing warbler and, and a host of other species. Another issue that's causing the decline of this bird is that they hybridize, particularly with blue wing warblers. So that makes, you know, conservation of, of golden wings very, very difficult when they hybridize. We also partner with uh, Virginia Commonwealth University and the Center for uh, Conservation Biology to get a sense of where these bear, or bears, <laughs> where these birds are on the landscape and their distribution across Virginia. Um, College of William and Mary, uh, VCU, as I mentioned, and us, we've been doing that since at least 2005 to get a sense of where, where, where the birds are on the landscape. Um, and you can see from left to right, there's some declines in where we've consistently been looking for the birds and we've, we've lost them. We've just not been able to pick them up. It looks like Dickinson County, Scott County, Washington County are areas where we have lost um, golden warblers already. And there may be some still in some of these areas, but um, it's consistently dropped off. Uh, same thing up Shenandoah, it looks like Rockingham, Madison, some of the sites that we've consistently had golden wing warbler we've lost. Uh, over time. So population trends, once we know where these birds are at on the landscape, we need to know if, where, how their populations are, are trending. Um, and basically throughout their range, we've seen declines up in the Great Lakes populations. It's been a 0.9% decline per year. Uh, and this is based on the North American Breeding Bird Survey, but in the Appalachian region where we are, we've seen at least a point or an 8.6% decline annually. Um, so showing some declines there. Cornell, a uh, lab of ornithology, has also been monitoring golden wing warblers across the range, but particularly here in the Appalachians. 
they've seen a, at least a 5% annual decline over a five year period. So we know one way or the other, the, this species is declining. Um, and then of course there's ecological research, uh, VCU, Virginia Commonwealth University, as I mentioned, they've been doing some um, surveys of the birds, but also looking at habitat and characterizing suitable habitat. Again, this is an example of the type of habitat they like, more of an open shrubby uh, grassland interspersed with other, kind of a mosaic with some other um, timbered lots. Uh, we found through VCU that if you use playback, if you, if you play the calls, it can increase the occupancy of a particular site. So that's kind of a way to kind of attract uh, golden wings to what would otherwise be an um, unoccupied habitat that might be suitable. We've also done some geolocator studies, and it's really amazing. You know, I showed you the GPS collar location data for elk earlier. Well, this is the, the tiny, super lightweight uh, version of, for a bird. Uh, and it's amazing, the technology that we have now. Um, but we outfit these little birds. They don't, it just doesn't influence them at all. But we're able to get location data of each individual. And that's really helpful. And if you go get a little bit further back, you can see where their migration routes are through those geolocators. And you can even find in uh, South America and parts of Central America where they winter. And that, of course, is the other side of the coin. It's one thing to talk about habitat and issues here in Virginia, but these birds, when they migrate, having habitat protections and, um, you know, a good situation for them in terms of conservation where they winter is important as well. So from a study from 2018, um, Kramer and others, found that the Great Lakes uh, populations of golden wings typically go to uh, Central American countries to, to winter, uh, whereas our Appalachian birds typically go to uh, South America, Colombia particularly. And it shows kind of, again, it gets back to the more comprehensive approach. We really have to consider where these birds are on the landscape throughout their uh, life cycle. Uh, not just breeding grounds here, uh, but migratory routes and the wintering grounds. It's very crucial. So for us uh, here at DWR, for example, we have the Highland Wildlife Management Area in Highland County. It's kind of a high elevation uh, mountainous area where we have some open early successional type habitat that we maintain um, with not only golden wings, but other species in mind. Um, so that's really uh, helpful. We have location data to kind of help target wildlife habitat projects. So that's some of the stuff, for example, that we do. The federal government also has a plan in place to help private landowners. It's called Working Lands for Wildlife. Um, I think out west, sage, sage grouse is a, a target of this program out west. With the same thing in mind, basically trying to, to um, incentivize private landowners and conservation projects to help the species with, before they get listed, to try to stave off li federal listing. And that's what is happening here throughout the Appalachian region um, through that uh, program. And basically what it does is just incentivize landowners to maintain and manage shrublands and to keep that early open, uh, early successional habitat in place. Uh, we're also doing that with the VPA HIP program. We've got some Tazewell County and Russell County landowners who maintain that kind of habitat and we can help expand and improve that habitat and also allow some, some viewing of shrike, for example. Um, but that all, this program, um, Working Lands for Wildlife, is certainly set up to really help uh, golden wing warblers on private lands. Getting back again to migration, Again, um, we, we really see where these birds migrate through and then also their wintering locations. And of course, in between there, there are lots of hazards and lots of things that they could uh, encounter in their migration routes that we need to consider in terms of conservation of the species. The wintering grounds particularly seems to be in Colombia. Um, we are very fortunate here in the United States to have environmental laws to have funding for uh, environmental protection, for land um, protection through the Forest Service, the Park Service, and so on, and have these programs like Working Lands for Wildlife, for example, to help species like this. Other countries, uh, not so much. They, they're not as fortunate. They're not set up to do that. 
Um, so it's good to know specifically where these birds are going through the geolocators so we can help target and work with these other countries um, to target conservation practices um, over there. So we have working groups. There's the Golden Wing Warbler Working Group within Virginia, other state and federal partners, private landowners, but we also have more of a regional uh, working group as well that are very helpful to sort of target, uh, to learn more, to share uh, research and information about what's working and what's not to try to help uh, save the species. So I have to, at the end here, I need to sort of make a plug for early successional habitat in general. Um, whippoorwill, another species that's in decline that we're concerned about, um, really depend upon um, sort of a mosaic, kind of like what uh, golden wing warblers like, but particularly uh, regenerating patches. This is a, a study from 2008 um, describing habitat selection and, and abundance of whippoorwills. And I have to say, a lot of you, this will come to home. Um, I think a few years ago, a lot, a lot of us were a little concerned about a, a clear cut at the base of uh, Big Stone or Stone Mountain at, there out of Tacoma. Um, but to be honest with you, I did a, a, a woodcock survey this spring. The only place, the one and only place I've ever heard any whippoorwills since the five and a half years that I've been here was in that patch. It has regenerated and grown back up uh, quite a bit now, particularly with, with maple and poplar. Um, but that place was loaded with whippoorwill. So that was quite exciting to see. Um, but again, just try to put a plug in there for, for responsible, uh, sustainable uh, creation and improvement of early successional type habitat is sorely, sorely lacking and needed for a whole host of species. Uh, wood thrush, another species, again, a mosaic of early and mid successional forest stands. They can benefit from early successional habitat that also benefits golden wing, whippoorwill, deer, uh, bear, turkey, all uh, woodcock, grouse, all, all, everything. You know, there's, there's tremendous uh, benefits to early successional habitat. Here's another uh, journal article from 2006. Uh, promoting a variety of age classes across the landscape that would benefit bats. Uh, obviously a huge concern for us uh, with, with peony species of bats in Southwest Virginia, but really good foraging. You know, when you have uh, early successional habitat, you're gonna have a lot of flowering plants and forbs that provide insects, food for insects, and other forage species for, um, for bats. So those are important. And Pollinators, I just mentioned insects, another species that, a uh, host of species that benefit from early successional habitat with pollinator species um, of plants and shrubs and um, particularly forbs, flowering forbs. So with that, um, I think I've, I've said my piece about early successional habitat and describing our interest in plight of the golden warbler. If you have any questions, feel free to give me a call uh, I also, my, my email address is there. Uh, if you want to send me an email, I'm happy to try to answer questions. If I can't answer those questions, I'll get you with someone who can. Uh, particularly, as I mentioned, I'm not an expert at golden wing warblers, but they sure are a, a beautiful species and one that uh, we sure want to try to reverse the declines on. But also our website here, dwr.virginia.gov, if you're interested in uh, the VPA HIP program, if you're a landowner, uh, if you're interested in elk information, the elk cam is all on there. So I encourage you to, to check that out. So with that, I, uh, thanks again for tuning in. Thanks again for having me, High Knob Nationalist Chapter, and uh, we'll see you down the road. Thanks. Take care.